I'm very excited to introduce one of the Longwood Symphony bass players, Dr. Jack Dennerline. Hi, Jack. Thanks for joining me. Hi, how are you? It's good to I'm see you, good. Bridget. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, Jack, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Jack. Um, that's what I usually say when I get introduced in a crowd. Um, I'm a professor at the Bouvet College of Health Sciences at Northeastern University. Um, I'm an engineer by training um, that looks at workplace uh, safety and health. Um, with, an, with a slant towards ergonomics. So uh, you play the bass as well. So do you think about ergonomics when you're playing the bass? <laughs> so there is some irony that I play the bass and I teach ergonomics because, um, you know, people, people always comment like, why did you pick that instrument? Why don't you play the piccolo? And so I always tell that to a piccoloist when I meet them. But um, <laughs> I... Um, uh, you know, the instrument is, uh, you know, I, I play with a stool. I think as I've gotten older, I remember when I was younger, we stood. Now we, now I, as I got older, I think it was around when I turned 30, I discovered the bass stool and started sitting down more. Um, and I noticed that with my colleagues who joined the orchestra from med school, they often stand, but over time they start sitting as we get older. <laughs> but um, that's, uh, you know, and so when I first joined the orchestra um, in 1988, I think it was, um, I, I, I used to stand and then I went to grad school out in California and when I came back and joined the orchestra again, I came back with a stool <laughs> and an ergonomics training. <laughs> Can you tell us about the, um, your advice on working in a home office, creating a home office? Yeah, so working at home has become a challenge for all of us, right, who, who are working remotely. I mean, there's also the essential workers and they're facing challenges that are probably much, you know, much more, um, you know, life threatening than our than our home office. But in our home office, yeah, we've, we've been challenged with not having all the tools that we have at our at our workplace, you know, we don't have the, the fancy steel case, um, or Herman Miller or the latest, you know, um, Aaron chair from Herman Miller. We don't have all that stuff at home. Some of us do, but we don't, we, 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 most likely we don't. And so we've been challenged with that. The other thing I noticed about working at home is we are glued to our computers. You know, we're in Zoom meetings and I now feel like I'm in a call center and a call center worker who never can leave their desk. Um, you know, I'm going from one meeting to the next. And so that that aspect of it's really, really important too. But yeah, for 30 years, when I, I did my PhD work in um, understanding sort of how, we, how the hands actually type, so that's where I, I took my uh, engineering degree and looked at finger movements and the motor control and looking at how we interact with keyboards and looking at, you know, this was the early 90s when the computers were becoming very popular and understanding how to design the equipment better to, for improving performance and, and, and reducing the risk of injury. That's sort of been my, my research area is really looking at how does design impact um, health and safety and injury prevention. And so, you know, the keyboard, the mouse, there was a lot of efforts around designing that. that. Nowadays, it's the mobile technology. And, in the, in, and we've learned a lot about people who have to sit at their desk for a long period of time. At the home, we don't have all that equipment. So we've had to sort of be really creative and each of us have had to sort of find our own solutions. And uh, the way I teach office ergonomics isn't about the rules, but about the approach and what's sort of the first principles you have to do, you know, and it comes down to sort of three concepts. And I'll just share them real quickly with you. It's how is your body supported? You know, how is your chair supporting you, especially your low back? Do you have support with your back? Can you reach the back of that? And you can do a lot with, pillows and things like that. Um, but also your forearms, your forearms need support, you know, um, thinking about where do you put your arms, do you, you know, and do they have a comfortable place to rest, you know, either your arms or your chair. And often the, I'm looking at a chair that I have over here where the arms are far apart. That's not very comfortable. You need them close to your body. And women know that more than, more than, more than we do and stuff. So um, the other thing is visual, you know, our body follows the eyes and most musicians know this too, because we, you know, especially in the orchestra, you, you know, Ronnie, our, our conductor really always wants us to make sure we're looking at him. So we have to set up our stands and everything so we can see it. Well, the same is true with your monitor and your, and, and your, you know, what you're looking at. And one of the issues is laptops. Most of us have laptops at home. They're often low. And when they're low, your head turns down and you get neck pain. 
things like that. So got to bring it up like Ronnie and looking at like you're looking at Ronnie while we're in the orchestra and trying to look at the look at look at him while you're also reading your music at the same time. And so that they're the same so you can see the cues and stay in sync with the conductor. That's why um, these little things are handy. A wireless yeah. keyboard. Yeah, because that way my my yeah. laptop's elevated and I can type and still be looking forward. Exactly. I think, you know, one of the things I, I tell people both also not all with laptops, but like with iPads and things like this, even your phones, you know, even your phones accessorizing. And so on the back of my phone, I have a little, you know, people have those tabs and stuff. I have something that's a little bit different. What I like about it is I can hold it and I don't drop it as much. But the other thing is I can put it on a surface. I have a book right here that I can use and I can put it on a surface and doing that, and you notice that it's at an angle. So when I, whoops, it's getting a little old, I need a new one. But as I, so what happens is I look at it a little, with it, having it raised up a little bit helps me look at it um, without, if it was flat, I tend to go look over it more and hunch over. But but by just elevating the angle of it, I can look at it. Um, I, I sit up a little bit more and look at it with a little bit more neutral. I mean, I can't hold it like this all day because then my shoulder gets gets painful. But if I can set up my laptop up on a, some stands or you know on some books or boxes or what have you around the house, then I can you know I can raise up my head and I can be more balanced and just put less stress on my body. There's a lot of um, parallels in what you're talking about and Alexander technique. Uh, yes. Have you studied that at all? I have not studied the Alexander technique. Um, it is sort of, you know, I look at design, how design impacts behavior. And I think Alexander technique looks at behavior and how do you sort of behave. And, you know, in music, it's really hard because the design is what it is. You know, we don't, when we sit, you know, sit at, um, at our music stands and we sit on the, uh, on the chairs, we have these, you know, not adjustable chairs, but, we, but we're actually performing, we're actually moving around a lot. And so we need to be more balanced and so that we can do all the, all the reaching. The instruments have, are, you know, are centuries old design, some of them, um, although people have modified clarinets. There's a, a physician, he used to be out at UCSF, um, at University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, where he looked at, the, he was a clarinet player and he actually redesigned the clarinet. Um, there's a fangled sort of odd shaped viola because violas are bigger than the violin. So the violist has to reach further and you know, to reach the, and, and so there was a new fangled one that sort of brought it closer so that people didn't have to reach as far with it and thing. I think for me as a bassist is, you know, is, is looking at the French versus German Boeing and um, you know that's a whole different motor control and a different grip and so you're using different muscles with that kind of bow and I you know I don't think there's been any study of looking at sort of the bow of the of, of that I know one of um, our principal basis uses a uses a um, German bow which you hold more like this and 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 um, I use a French bow because I actually started playing violin before uh, before playing bass when I was smaller and then moved to the bass when when, um, when the bass player in my school district moved away and I wanted to play something more masculine, I thought the bass would be more masculine. Little did I know that it was actually more feminine, but that's another story. And, but the, the, the idea of, um, but I, so I, I play the French bow, which is like a violin or cellist, you know, any, most string players will play, you know, modern string, str string players have a French bow. Um, so yeah, so that's, so I, I find, you know, the ergonomics and music, music to be so inter, interrelated. And a big thing for musicians is, you know, they, they suffer a lot from overuse syndromes, more so than I think a computer person does because they're practicing, you know, eight hours a day and it can make or break a career for a young musician or even an established musician. So right now, obviously, things are a little different um, with the pandemic, and there's a lot of concern over workplace safety and worker safety, and you've been doing some work on that. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so, so my research in the last 30 years has gone beyond the office. I've looked at healthcare workers, we've looked at construction workers, I've looked at truck drivers in my research. And right now, we were right in the middle of a research project with construction workers at a construction site here in Boston when the stay-at-home order came about, this construction site was considered essential, and so they continued working. 
And we quickly transitioned our research project for general health and safety to COVID-19 related safety, um, infection control and how infection control changed the workplace. The pandemic and COVID-19 and all the infection controls is changing how we work. Work will not be the same as it was before for a long time until vaccine comes along, but even then we're, we've got a slow um, economic recovery and the next pandemic and being prepared for the next pandemic has changed work. And that changing of work has created a tension between sort of how we do our work, how we, how we know to do our work and how we have to do our work now. And that tension is creating stress for workers and creating a lot of, um, you know, just sort of a tension between those requirements of making sure you're safe around infection control, making sure you're safe at your workplace, but all, you know, in terms of the risk, especially in construction, and also getting your job done. So all three of those things are, are at play. And that just adds a lot of stress to the workers overall in terms of what they're doing. So, you know, COVID-19 has put, you know, has put requirements on the workplace that we didn't have before around physical distancing, around face covering, and around, um, around personal hygiene and, and, and washing our hands and the like. The issue is that those are very specific things that haven't been taking into consideration the context of, of the workplace. And while those are very specific, there's no guidance in how you integrate that into your own workplace. How do you integrate these things into your own workplace? So given a construction site, which is you know, through demolition, you can imagine the, the hygiene is very little there. In fact, I was going by a construction site just last weekend and I saw you know, a Home Depot um, utility sink set up with water to it, just sort of on the side of the, side of the construction zone with a, a portable hot water heater, um, electric, port all sort of set up outside. And I'm like, that's COVID-19 related. You know, they wouldn't have had that before. To have a hand washing station at a construction site before was, was unheard of. So just so to see that in that construction site was kind of unique. So anyway, what we've done with the work that I'm involved in at the Center for Work, Health and Wellbeing, which is based at Harvard University, um, is we have a process where we, that helps people integrate sort of specific health and safety um, regulations and rules and things like that into their context of how they do their everyday job and how, we, how you weave it into the organizational culture and so that it becomes part of how you work and how you do something every day. So what we've done in the last month and a half with our work is taken that process and adapted it to COVID to give guidance to workplaces to learn how to take the specific requirements that the CDC um, is putting out there for people when they return to work and giving them a process of how do you incorporate that into the context of your own organization. Because no one's giving us the systems, of, systems approach to how to do that. And our approach at the Center for Work Health and Wellbeing is this sort of integrated model, total worker health approach to looking at how you look at all aspects of work and integrate safety and health and well-being into the things we do every day. Wow, that's incredible that in what a month and a half you figured out how to adapt <laughs> this work that you've been doing to the current circumstances. It's really amazing how our this work so this work, this total worker health initiative is about 15 years old. It was started by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. There's six centers of excellence funded across the country. Harvard has one which, um, which where, where they collaborate with people from Northeastern where I'm at, um, Boston College, Boston University, and um, um, the MGH and, and Brigham and Women's Hospital System as well. And so we, um, this program is really has been really in a way been pre preparing for a situation because the pandemic really is about total worker health it's about infection control it's about um, exposure assessment making sure people don't get exposed to the to the virus um, looking at how you look at design how do you change work to integrate this into what you do every day it all the all the tools that we've been developing have been really um, preparing for this moment. And in a way, unconsciously did we know that it was the pandemic would really bring this to the forefront. But the pa pandemic has brought it to the forefront. When we think about how many workers, especially the essential workers have died, um, April 28th, um, which was a few weeks ago now, was the annual Mem Workers Memorial Day. It's the day we pay tribute to the workers who died uh, while working. And this year was it was especially poignant with the number of workers, especially healthcare workers in New York and in Italy and in China um, and, and here in Boston and, and in the um, 
um, the transit workers who have died as a result of COVID-19 because they got exposed at work. Um, and, and that has, you know, as we reopen the economy and start regrowing, um, you know, we, we actually have to think about the three phases of reopening, reimagining, and then rebuilding. And those three phases are what we got to think about in terms of worker safety and health and how we do work. And so getting back to my original comment, COVID-19 has changed the way we work and it's going to be around for a long time, how those changes will be around for a long time. Wow, so you're doing all of this, and how do you find time to also be a musician? <laughs> I have to say, I am so lucky to play in the Logwood Symphony. It is my therapy. It is my escape from work. I come, you know, I always sort of in the morning think, oh God, I've got rehearsal tonight. <laughs> how am I gonna get it done? And then somehow it happens, and I just show up and for two and a half hours, sometimes three, we make music together and it is so therapeutic for me and that it allows me to sort of escape from that and take joy in the healing powers of music that we talk about in the Longwood Symphony. And, and I learn something new each time. You know, for me, it's the way of learning new music, learning the musicality about it. That's one of the things I love about Ronnie as our music director is he really guides us through through the history of the music and the meaning and his interpretations and and talks about other people's interpretations and his experiences and and having that social connection uh, around music has just been so healthy and and it's something that I think kept me in Boston in the long term. I had opportunities to leave and, and lots of things have kept me here, but Longwood has been one of those things that I think if I'd gone somewhere else, I would have missed, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. I went away for five years to, to Berkeley, to California, and I joined the orchestra there, but it wasn't the same. It was much, you know, the community sense that Longwood provides is just so important to my life and to the life of so many other people in the orchestra and then our, and then our beneficiaries that we do the fundraising with as well. I'm not even a musician in the orchestra, and I feel all of that, too, when I'm at rehearsal. It's really incredible. Yeah, we're so lucky, and yet, and we, but we're so dedicated, too, and I think that's one of the things about the orchestra, too, is, um, is that we show up, you know, we might not be prepared at rehearsal number one, but, you know, we get serious, and we know how to get serious, and we do a great, you know, we, we, we I think we add stress to Ronnie's life, but <laughs> but we get there and he's always relieved at the end as, and, and during as well the concert. And it's so much fun to make music and, and to put on our tuxedos and get on the stage and perform for our friends, our friends and our, the communities that we serve. Well, we're certainly glad that uh, the orchestra had a role in keeping you around. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, many things did, but that's, yeah, I, it was always something that was there, like, oh, if I leave Boston, what am I going to do for music and stuff? So, yeah, it's, we're very lucky to have Longwood here. Longwood is definitely also lucky to have you for over 30 years. <laughs> I think our principal player is younger than that. <laughs> well, thank you again, Jack. It was really great to talk to you, and I hope that you are staying safe and healthy and wishing you the best. Thank you very much.